Good morning all, wherever you may be joining us from, and welcome to the ICAS Insights webinar in conversation this morning with the three ICAS office bearers. I'm Bruce Cartwright, Chief Executive of ICAS, and today I'm your webinar host. Our session today will aim to last an hour, and we'll hear from our three office bearers discuss the three CA agenda themes of talent, trust, and technology. Before finishing off, somewhere along the line, we'll have a couple of audience polls. So we've got some good questions already submitted. We hope to hear from more questions from you, and hopefully on your screen, if you look at your toolbar, you will see a Q&A button. If you do want to submit a question at any point in time, please put it on the Q&A. We may not get through them all, we might have to deal with some afterwards, but I will do my best to submit them along the way. So first of all, I'd like to begin this webinar by introducing the topic properly. The CA Agenda is ICAS's thought leadership and insight series, focusing on key challenges that we are facing at this time of considerable change. Within its themes of trust, talent and technology, the CA Agenda tackles the key issues that impact our profession and provides thought and analysis of what might be around the corner for us all. And the corner is certainly looming very large at the moment. So before I introduce our three panelists this morning, let's just watch a short animated video. So let me start by introducing our three panelists for today. Catherine Burnett, our newly elected president of ICAS. Catherine is full-time job regional chair for KPMG in Scotland. And as I said, recently appointed the ICAS new president for 2020-21. Catherine's career at KPMG spans more than 20 years. She's held, held roles in Edinburgh, London, and the US. Catherine is also a member of the Financial Services Advisory Board to Scottish Government. So Catherine, trained as a CA with KPMG in Edinburgh, qualifying in 1997, became a partner in 2009, spent two years in KPMG in the US, working on global blank banking clients. And after returning to Scotland in 2011, Catherine led the KPMG financial services team, and became regional chair of KPMG Scotland in 2016. At the same time, considerable involvement with ICAS since 2011, First as chair of the audit committee, well done Catherine, chair of the oversight board, well done again, and then become a member of the council all through that since 2011, vice president 1819, deputy president 1920, and now president. So well done Catherine for that journey, and you fitted all that volunteer work alongside your full-time job. Bruce Pritchard is the chief operating officer, international liminal biosciences, he spent over two decades working in the life sciences and pharmaceutical industry. Bruce has more than 13 years experience with Liminal, held a number of senior global positions across that organization. And Bruce, prior to being appointed CEO in 2014, you were group CFO, a role you've held since 2008. So Bruce brings a proven track record of success in strategic acquisitions, raising debt and equity finance. As well as being a CA, 
Bruce has got, got many years experience in management and operations. And prior to joining Liminal, Bruce worked as a senior director for CV Therapeutics, a NASDAQ lifted biopharmaceutical company. And I don't know if I can say that word again, pharmaceutical, without getting it wrong. Bruce, graduate from Harriet Watt University, he gained a BA in accounts in computer science. He is an ICAST member, of course, and a fellow of the Institute of Directors. As, in addition, Bruce is an experienced trustee, non-executive director, and audit committee chair. Indy Hoti, Indy is the co-founder of Upside Projects, a great name Indy, consultancy and venture builder, which provides strategic, strategic advice on digital transformation, innovation, and sustainability to public and private sector clients. Prior to Upside Projects, Indy was a senior economist with EY in London. I would quite like to see your predictions just now, Indy. He worked across a number of high profile economic impact studies which influenced public bodies and included clients such as the Premier League and Rugby World Cup. And there'll be some interesting discussions going on in that arena just now. Indy has a passion for social humanitarian causes. He was a trustee of Calsa Aid International, a charity which provides humanitarian aid in disaster areas and civil conflict zones. His work has led him to the front line on a number of projects, including Iraq, DR Congo, Lebanon, Nepal, and Haiti. Indy was one of our earlier One Young CA members and gained the title in 2015. And he joined ICAST Council in 2016, representing firstly England and Wales area and supporting engagement, particularly amongst the under 35s and the broader London community throughout the, under, the London area network. So there are our three office bearers. Welcome to you all. I think it's, I think it's only fair that we start with President Catherine. And Catherine, turning first to the theme of trust. So why is it important to you and, and what has ICAST done to help you? Thank you, Bruce, and thank you for the welcome. i um, delighted to be on the webinar this morning. Um, I, I think for, well, for me personally, and I'm sure like many of our members, trust is absolutely critical to being able to operate in the environment and the business environment that I operate in. So whether that's as an audit partner or leading my team at KPMG, or indeed in my role as ICAS, trust is absolutely critical. Um, I think it's, it's sometimes interesting to go back to what is the definition of trust. And if you look at any, a dictionary, trust is defined as a firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, and strength of someone or something. And I think no matter whether you're talking about trust in someone or something, one thing's really clear, trust is earned, not given and it can take years to earn but i think as we've often seen it can take minutes to lose and i think that's a really important thing to remember in terms of what icas does i don't believe icas is there to explicitly teach anybody how to earn trust but what we can do is help the develop the individuals as it did i believe what it did for me because for me, trust is really a combination of capability, so of the knowledge that you have, whether that's of accounting standards or tax rules, um, but also importantly, behavior. And that's, that's what ICAS gave me. So it gave me the knowledge or the capability, but it also importantly gave me a grounding in ethics and the importance of behavior in, in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and the area of ethics has always been important to ICAS, but I think that has really come to the fore um, in, and has become much more visible and explicit over the last few years. So I think that combination of building capability, but also really grounding people in the right behaviour and the ethics um, is what ICAS can do to help individuals, each of us as individuals, earn trust around us. Okay, thank you. And, and you mentioned there, I think um, you, you mentioned trust can be lost in a minute and, and we do hear this phrase um, crisis of trust what, what's created that crisis of trust um, it's really interesting because you know I think you can look at an, an individual level and losing trust but actually if you go to um, the bigger picture and the, the broader environment one of the things that um, I often look at is the Edelman 20 uh, trust index because I think that gives us a picture on globally how trust is perceived um, and it, the, the 2020 Trust Index concluded that despite a really strong global economy at the time, obviously pre-COVID um, and at near full employment, 
none of whether it was government, business, NGOs, or the media, none of those bodies were were really fully trusted. And they attributed that to really people um, having a fear of the future and their role in it and not really believing that the system was designed um, to support or help them and, or not delivering for the majority. So, you know, the trust index found that people grant trust based on two attributes. And again, it comes back to the three attributes were competence or capability, as I talked about, and ethics. Business was viewed generally as competent, but low on ethical behavior. So I think, again, that brings us back to what is it that ICAS can do Firstly, around competence and capability and building that in our CAs, but also being able to provide that real ethical behaviour strand. Mm. And I would say that has come through more strongly in the last couple of years, whether that's via uh, the exams that we do or actually indeed the ethics code that has been set up within ICAS. So you, 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 you started to move on to the, what, what can ICAS do to restore trust? And, and if I combine that with... Um, so what we are doing actions to restore trust, but with the current crisis in coronavirus and, and disruption in the world, um, is it, how important is it for ICAST to continue to remain focused on trust? I, I mean, for me, and I'm sure for many, it's more important than ever because, you know, I think many, many people will look to business leaders to help rebuild the economy post COVID. And we have, you know, there's an expectation, I think, that's emerged on business through this crisis that we should be doing more to contribute to society um, and you know, be much more involved in, you know, whether it's you know, health and safety of our employees, you know, all of those types of aspects. So there's a really good opportunity to rebuild the economy with a stronger purpose and restore trust in business. And I think ICAST can certainly be part of that. So I touched on you know, the fact that we've got an ethics board, which has refreshed its strategy, looking at the trust, technology and talent agenda and how ethics combine across all three of those. Also looked at how best to engage with others, so other bodies, so not just looking at ICAS, but how we can work with other professional bodies to do that. Um, the power of one, I think, remains a really a very powerful aspect of, of ICAS that is, is really important in terms of the power that us each individual can have. Um, and I was reminded of that actually during the COVID crisis. I'm not sure how many people saw, but there was an advert at the time of COVID, which was really talking about um, lockdown and people um, you know, making sure that they did take part in lockdown. Um, and it was a row of matches sort of that were igniting across the matches. And when you pull one out, it can essentially stop the virus and again that reminded me of you know when I saw it it immediately reminded me of the ICAST power of one in that one match being removed from that row of from the row of matches ca can have an effect and I think that reminds us that actually that power of one document that ICAST wrote is still very relevant and even more relevant today. Okay thank you. Um, we, we'll, we'll come back to some of that and before we just I, I start asking Bruce a few questions on talent. Could I just remind the audience, if you do want to post a question on the Q&A, it is open, so feel free to put your questions in and we'll pick them up later on. So Bruce, talent. So we've got such advances in technology now and technology taking over processes and doing jobs for some humans. Um, how important does talent remain? Well, thanks Bruce. I, I think, um, going back to you know, picking up on some of the points that Catherine made earlier, for me, talent is where it, you know, talent's where it all begins. Um, you know, talent is what's required to deal with the unexpected. The current COVID crisis has been a perfect example of that. You know, te technology is great, but algorithmic thinking doesn't necessarily deal with the exceptions well, and and that's where that's where talent comes in. So for me. You know, talent kind of trumps technology. It's needed to embrace technology to ensure that technology fits with our, our life. And talent is required to drive um, trust in our profession and, and, and trust more generally. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we have to continue focusing on our people. Um, we have to continue focusing on making sure that we embed the right skills and ethical approach 
in, in you know in the membership. Uh, you know where you have circumstances where um, you know outcomes differ. Uh, you know it's it's that ability to rely upon your experience and your knowledge uh, that allows you to influence um, in the best possible way uh, the right outcome for that situation. Um, you know, if we if we look at the the CA in today's environment, you know we we have the experience across our membership base to take that kind of non-algorithmic approach to the problems that we're currently facing, uh, and to provide those kind of tailored solutions um, that will allow us to move forward from where we are today. So all all of that long winded way of saying that I think that you know if if we do not focus on talent at the heart of what we do as part of the CA agenda, our ability to influence trust is, is eroded. Um, and I think our ability to manage the technology to the best possible effect is, is limited. And, and just staying on that theme, so, so ICAS obviously works in conjunction with a number of, a number of employers to bring through good talent and, um, and, and bring them into our membership. So, so how, do, how should we go about identifying and growing that best talent? Uh, you know, f- again, you know, for me, this is always about our our pipeline. Um, you know, we we have uh, we have members at different stages, and we have members that don't yet know that they want to be members of our institute, and that's really where we should be, you know, starting to think about this. Um, we we are um, we're in danger if we're not smart about this um, of excluding uh, some very talented individuals from being able to become members of this institute. So I think we have to have uh, a a constantly kind of evolving approach as to how we look at the prospective CAs and making sure that we've got as many open routes to to entry that uh, that we can have to make sure that no one who's got the right ability is, is disadvantaged from becoming a CA. And then if we kind of move on from that into our, our student population, you know, I think we do a good job of consulting with the, the firms and with industry to make sure that our syllabus continues to evolve. But we, we have to do that. We have to constantly keep on top of uh, evolving our syllabus to make sure that we're equipping uh, those CAs that are coming through our training uh, program to come into the business world with the most relevant and up-to-date skills um, to, you know, to, to, to face the challenges of the, the, the modern workplace. We have then on the back of that, a, a great amount of collateral um, that is available to us as training materials. And I, you know, I think we can probably do a little more with that for our existing members. I mean, we we obviously encourage our existing members to undertake CPD to make sure that they're uh, relevant in in their own uh, working environment. But, you know, we could probably do more to help that. And I think, uh, you know, if we look at some of the material that we create and if we can make that a little more electronically available to existing members, we can help uh, to, to keep people um, you know, up to date to keep that, that, that uh, talent sharp. And then if you think about all, all of that together, you know, what we have within our membership base is a, a great opportunity to, to network our members together, whether that's uh, you know, established members just you know, ha- having appropriate forums to discuss issues of the day, or whether it's mentoring opportunities uh, for members to, to, to cross fertilize skills with one another. I think these are, these are all important things. And I think, you know, just talking about mentoring, it's important to remember that, that, that mentoring is maybe not, uh, it's not always about the, um, uh, the more established members looking after the younger members coming through. Actually, um, it never ceases to amaze me how much I learn when I listen to some of our uh, new members uh, that, that I've got, you know, more up-to-date skills in certain areas of, of business than I have. So it's, uh, you know, that, that, that should be cross, cross-functional. cross And then lastly, you know, we have, uh, as an institute, the, the ability um, to network uh, a, across other professional bodies 
to make sure that we are cross-fertilizing our own skill set with knowledge and skills from other organizations. And I think all of those things go together uh, into a program to, to help us you know, grow and manage the talent within the Institute. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Now, now there's one interesting phrase I'll, I'll come back to that, and I think I'm quoting you correctly here. You referred to the nice phrase, it was members, members, I think you said members who don't know they're likely to become members. So that's a lovely phrase because it's a thought of this. There's folk out there, young and perhaps older, who, who are potential members and who may be on that journey. So how do we ensure as ICAST that, that we attract that best talent that says, yes, I want to train as a chartered accountant with ICAST? So I think, you know, I, I think there's a couple of aspects to that. I mean, there's a, there, there is a um, very pragmatic and practical aspect to that, that you know, not every member has the choice that it's ICAST that they want to train with. Um, that choice is made for them by their, by their training firm. Um, and I think, you know, we can make sure that we are, um, you know, back to my point about relevance in, in, in the syllabus and the flexibility around that, we need to continue to, to do that so that the firms want to train uh, with ICAST, but but more importantly, we have to, I think, keep working on uh, the ICAST brand as being a brand that people want to associate themselves with uh, as a chartered accountant, and that's down to you know a, a whole variety of things. Uh, but that's you know to, to me, it's about um, having thoughtful content. It's about having thorough research into areas that perhaps are. Uh, you know, not necessarily typical areas for, uh, you know, for an institute to be out there talking about. We should be at the forefront of thought leadership on certain things. And, and it's also about us making sure that we get the PR machine working so that ICAST becomes, you know, truly well known. I think we do a good job uh, on that in, in certain areas. And I think, you know, uh, we probably all um, uh, admit that there's probably other areas where we, we need to work harder at our PR so that ICAS is recognized as the preeminent body uh, to go to for an opinion on certain things. And by getting the Institute more broadly known for that thing, for, for those types of things, is how we start, I think, getting enthusiasm for new members coming through. Um, you know, I, I also think that we, you know, I, I mentioned this sort of uh, making sure that the doors are open. I think we absolutely have to ensure that we do not uh, inadvertently exclude uh, members from being able to become a member of this institute because we insist on a certain route to entry. We have to be as, as open as we can to make sure that we attract the uh, the best talent and you know we've got a great example of that you know with the with the ICAST foundation and the work that the foundation is doing in terms of assisting uh, individuals who may not necessarily have been able to get into ICAST uh, because of their their own personal circumstances and, and helping with that I think the, the more we can do around that kind of thing uh, the better it will be for all of us as we go forward. Okay thank you Bruce now I can see a couple of questions coming Coming through on the chat line, if I could just remind people, I will pick up those questions, but if you could, if you've got a question, press the Q&A button and if you put it there, it's probably easier to see them coming in, but I will pick up the chat ones as well. So, Indy, thank you for that, Bruce, and we will come back to you and Catherine, but Indy, so you can slightly park your economist hat, but not entirely, but I'm going to ask you on the theme of technology and no doubt economy is linked to that. So, COVID-19, what does that mean for ICAS and technology? So it's really interesting discussion that we've had around we trust uh, and talent and i really see technology as much more of an enabler so rather than you know the the, the when you speak to sort of futurists that think about you know technology taking over all aspects of our life yes it may do but actually the human element will always be there and now referring back to sort of covid19 at the moment it is a hugely disruptive event for society all around the globe and i've been very very impressed with the work that ICAS has been doing in this regard. And it, it goes back to one of the one of the comments that Ross Wilson has made around we are being, you know, we, we, we do challenge ourselves, but it's also recognizing what we've done. So I'll share some of the insights in terms of the Institute using technology um, as an enabler to connect with its members and provide support. So obviously, first off, we have the the coronavirus hub that provides 
support material and guidance for for all of our members that were that was set up in record time and has been used extensively by our members and has been used to influence public policy as well we've also then got the the, the big piece around member engagement so between the 8th of april 2020 and 26th of may so roughly six to seven weeks we've we've delivered roughly 13 webinars right so 13 webinars uh, using digital technology that's available to our members whether they're in edinburgh whether whether they're in london whether they're in hong kong or anywhere around the world uh, time zones aside of of course but a range of topics whether it's you know members in practice whether it's around mental health, whether it's around broader business and macro macro trends. So we've been able to engage with those members. And I think from looking at the recent statistics, we've had over 1,600 members attend those events. And looking at the engagement on that as well, those all of those members, the average time in a one hour webinar has been 55 minutes. So our members have been attending those webinars in great numbers and also engaging with 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 that, with that content right through to the end which i think is um, absolutely fantastic and then if we look at our future talent right our pipeline our students moving over to a digital delivery model in record time ensuring that we have students that are coming through the pipeline especially in 2020 um, and we're supporting their, their, their ca qualification that has happened as well in record time to, to provide that quality ed education uh, to ensure that, that you know people in our the story the students in in our institute that will be coming through um, are supported uh, as well so i've been hugely proud of what we've done in terms of enabling and using technology and one piece to add around that as well is also the icast podcast right so now we are sharing our broader thought leadership on the ca agenda with the wider world that's accessible on a number of platforms that are, are readily available so apple spotify etc and actually talking about uh, the piece around our future talent which is very important we actually got a me uh, message from a ca member uh, a week a week ago that their that the children were watching and were listening to one of the podcasts around mental health with with uh, johnny jacobs from starbucks and actually the main hook for them was actually well starbucks i know about starbucks i want i want to listen to this podcast and all of a sudden they're engaging with that content and they're thinking around icas and cas are at the forefront of their mind so we're, we're really leveraging that technology there to be able to you know engage with our with our broad member base even during this period of significant disruption where you know uh, social distancing is in place and face-to-face -face interaction has been limited as a result okay so so actually that that was that was very very helpful and also you you, you hid under a bushel there in the sense that you are the author of the i uh, the, the ipods and, and i know you put an awful lot of work into that so well done you um, but coming on to so technology and ICAST, let's let's open it up wider. And, and this is a, quite a this is a fairly open question. So, how is technology shaping and benefiting our profession? So, I think if we if we look at some of the emergent technologies which we have been talked about in business and broader society, so whether it's AI, AR, VR, blockchain the the increasing adoption of that and it's becoming much more mainstream will impact the way businesses operate so even looking for example at audit where you've got you know if you're looking at blockchain technology you can access unalterable audit evidence in real time you no longer you know you're no longer reviewing sample data you can look at the entire data set it's no longer backwards looking you're looking at data in, in real time so it really influences the way our auditors work and the human element then becomes so increasingly much more important so we're looking at professional judgment we are looking at sort of ethics we're looking at the, the the human element around being able to interpret that data and understanding what the impact is on, on organizations so we have so much more rich data at our fingertips by using these uh, these emergent technologies which are now mainstream it gives such a huge opportunity for CAs to no longer be seen as sitting within the finance function but actually trusted business advisors and business leaders who are using their competence their acumen and their judgment uh, to navigate you know the broader business world okay and 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 challenges from that I think one of the one of the key challenges, and, and we'll see this over the next decade, is you know, for example, looking at increased automation and the use of technology, there will be a number of roles that will no longer be relevant. There will be a lot of retraining and reskilling required. Um, there will be a number of new roles that were that weren't seen before that become commonplace. And I think you know 
referring that back to our members, we as business leaders in, in very, very prominent positions, whether that's, you know, working in an audit function or being the CFO or a CEO of an organization will play a big role in terms of navigating that environment, making sure that our members are equipped with the right skills, making sure that they know how to navigate the, 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 the business environment in terms of these technologies being increasingly adopted uh, within organizations. And especially if you're looking at the COVID-19 environment now, we're working with so many organizations that initially had a digital transformation plan or digital implementation plan over a 24 month period, which has been accelerated to literally six or 12 weeks. And, and so it's becoming increasingly more important, especially for those organizations that traditionally weren't as digitally enabled or technology focused are, 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 are realizing that that is the future and that will be a, play an important and fundamental part of their organization and also their business model. Okay, and, and, and yes, sitting in ICAS, I know exactly what you mean about the accelerating pace of change. Now, we're, we're going to come to some more of the questions from the audience, and, and I'm just going to direct these wherever, if you like. So um, the first one, actually, is, is, is a partly a statement and partly just a reflection of one of our, I would call, midlife career members. I'll just say trained, points out he trained in the 1970s. Um, very proud, very clearly proud of the profession he's in, and ICAS in particular. And just really questioning, uh, are we over apologetic sometimes for who we are? And should we perhaps focus on some of the positives? Because as he refers to, there are some really talented CAs and very many talented CAs. Catherine, what do you think? Um, I, I, I think it's interesting that sometimes it's perceived as being overly apologetic. Um, I guess my perspective would be that um, we we have to we absolutely have to focus on the positives and i think it aligns to what bruce was saying in terms of really attracting um talent into the profession is that we do focus on the positives um you know the trust the talent the technology what are we doing as icas um, but equally i do think we have to we we do have to challenge ourselves on a regular basis that we are keeping pace with the changes that are required in the, the you know the world around us and an example of that is, for example, you know, as you've referred to, um, the amount of change that has happened at ICAS in the last 10 weeks um, has been exponential, probably compared to yes. the last couple of years. Yes. And so at Council this week, actually, we've got a Council meeting, and one of the things we're doing is looking at what have been the learnings, what are the positives that we can take away from what's happened in the last 10 weeks, and how do we turn those into... Um, the sort of the, the opportunities and the positives going forward for ICAS, whether that's the ability of the staff to work from home and have a you know a more agile working environment from the staff at ICAS, or indeed you know the digital teaching of our students, the ability to do exams online, which has been a real positive because we're one of the very few institutes that has been able to do that. So you know I think um, I think it was Ross that raised this. You know they're absolutely we do need to focus on the positives, but I think we need to balance that with, with challenging ourselves um, as to what we continually need to do to, to keep pace uh, with change. Okay. And no, thank you, Catherine. And Catherine, when you were speaking there, you talked around the pace of change at ICAS, and, and, and we're very clear of the pace of change now, online delivery, et cetera. Um, question comes in that, that makes me reflect, but I think I'm gonna start with you, Bruce, in terms of, because in, in your capacity as, as well, uh, the members board chair as well. Um, the question we've got here is that given even the pace of change that's happening now, do, do you think the members understand how ICAS operates and works? I mean, everyone's got that image of coming through as a student, et cetera, but you know, we talk around the pace of change and what we're doing. Members board, you, you, you're in touch with a lot of members. Do, do they understand that? Are we failing to get a message across of what we're doing and how? Um, I think there's a real danger that that that, that actually is true. I think um, you know we we often get caught up in in the in the doing and in the delivery, and maybe don't often think enough about stepping back and looking at it from the other side and seeing well, what's what's the effect of this? But is is this impacting the way it should? You know, I, ICAS is a you know ICAS is a relatively complicated animal. I mean, I've been around the Institute for a number of years and it never ceases to amaze me that there's bits of the Institute that I find out about that I didn't 
really know existed or knew what, know what they do. So I, I'm not surprised to hear that people are, are, are a little bit, um, you know, in the dark about what the Institute does. So I, I do think there's work that we could do, um, you know, to, 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 to get that across more clearly. Um, I think, you know, you, you can look at that from, from two angles. Again, you know, back to my, for, for those members who don't yet know that they want to be members. Well, actually we need to do more to make sure that they understand what the Institute's about and why it's important and why it should be ICAST that they join. So absolutely on that front, I think there probably is more self-promotion that we should do around um, the, the shininess of the badge and the, the quality of what we do as a professional body. But for our existing members, it's also part of, uh, uh, you know, the sort of member value proposition, understanding the value that we deliver to our members for the subscription that they pay. Uh, it may not be absolutely clear about the extent of the work that goes on uh, within the body and, and the impact that that has for our members and the broader uh, the broader community. So a uh, long-winded answer to say we probably could do more um, and you know we, we should continue to, to make sure that we um, keep that under review and, and, and can keep evolving our PR about what we do as a machine. Okay thank you and um, turning I'm, I'm going to take a, a talent question and a technology question and put them together for you Wendy. So in terms of that, that development of talent would we benefit from linking up with other professions, lawyers, um, technology experts, uh, maybe think about how we might facilitate that. And I suppose the other side of that question is, is there a concern with the development of IT? Is that going to prohibit some of the uh, profession from continuing that journey if they're not IT literate? Sure. So I'll, I'll answer the, the second question first on that. And I think if we look at the way our profession is is structured, so no doubt our our learning environment um, incorporates elements around technology and how that's being used within business, and there's a big piece around ethics in that as well. I think for our existing members, you have to remember we we have the CPD framework. There's always training uh, um, and guidance available um, on, within ICAS to 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 facilitate that learning, and no doubt as part of any role, any job, there's always that ongoing learning and and development that's required and I know as, as, as an institute here we technology is part of the CA agenda we're, we're continually discussing it we're getting the best thought leaders on this on these topics to discuss how it will impact impact uh, businesses and organizations as well so I think there's that that big piece there around um, using using the framework of how our profession and, and institute is structured to facilitate that learning going back to the the, the first the first question um, which you may need to remind me again, Bruce. Um, well, it was that theme of, um, so we talk about ICAS as chartered accountants getting involved in technology. Um, do we need to be clever? Do we should be linking up with other professions, the lawyers? Uh, Bruce has got a computer science background there. So technology, should we, be, should we be broadening our outlook to collaborate with other professions? In short, my, my personal view, I think, is yes. There's, there's so much that can be achieved through, through collaboration between different industries and, and organisations. It's taking the best from each of those and, 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 and incorporating that in as our world becomes much more integrated. And that happens both ways, right? So speaking to technology industries and them understanding how the accountancy sort of framework and body works and sharing those learnings with them as well. So I think there is, there is a piece there, but there's also the piece around bringing that learning in to in and bringing that insight into our um, qualification and into our education which will be vital for long-term sustainability and long-term success we are i guess we, we are not the I wouldn't say gatekeepers, but we are the best of, I guess, the truth and sort of audit around giving uh, society comfort around how businesses are, are operating. And we need to make sure that we, we, we leverage what is the latest technologies as an enabler to, to allow us to do that. So no doubt there will always need to be that element of, of collaboration to make sure that we're at the leading edge and that we're at the cutting edge. Right. Can, can okay. I maybe add, Bruce, to, to that? Yes, I, I think, um, you know, picking up on one of the, the earlier points that, you know, we, we spoke about, um, you know, trust in, in the profession. And I, 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 you know, I, I feel quite strongly that, you know, I mean, tr trust in the profession is, uh, uh, you know, has clearly been eroded, but the, 
in order for us to restore trust in the profession, we need to also ensure that the professions work more closely together. You know, at the moment, there are independent frameworks that, that, that manage and, and oversee the different you know, professional entities that have oversight of corporate reporting more, more broadly. And I think having a, a, a greater degree of integration among some of those regulators would also be helpful. You know, it's it's hard to say that you know there's a there's an issue with audit unless you specifically talk about financial reporting or you talk about capital markets reporting, and then when you think about that, you also have to think about the uh, the role that the the broker dealers play in you know it's, it's selling shares and bringing investors into companies. So it's an ecosystem, and I think uh, you know as we move forward that that ecosystem has to work more closely together and and for us and for us as a professional body to help restore trust in the profession i think we also need to be helping to promote some of that integration in the broader ecosystem right so bruce no, thank you for that and, and bringing back to so we were on the future and then the here and now because i've got a question here and it's probably i'll probably start with catherine because because you're the auditor in the room catherine and in terms of um so there's a question directly about that ecosystem and the frc so we're all conscious of the journey of the audit debate going on, the audit reformation. And uh, I think it was about 10 days ago, uh, roughly 10 days ago, that the, the new chair of FRC Tubiaga resigned. Does that have implications about the spe speed of change and how things might develop? Oh, Catherine, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. There you, go. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so it's obviously disappointing that Simon Dingaman's resigned or stepped down from his role. Um, you know, having put him in in role alongside Sir John Thompson, that was obviously um, you know a step forward in terms of the change that was underway at the FRC. Um, you know, so it was disappointing that he stepped down while the FRC have got this extensive program underway in terms of driving change. However. You know, we do still have Sir John Thompson in role as the chief executive with an executive team and a programme that they are focused on. And certainly talking to Michelle Mullen, who many of you will know, but she leads this sort of relationship with the FRC from an ICAS point of view. He would definitely confirm that, um, you know, the regulator continues to drive that agenda um, and to progress with the work that they're doing. Um, and ICAST remains very committed to being part of that um, process and to feeding into uh, whether it's feedback or consultations and the debate, then ICAST remains very committed to that. And I do believe that is an important part of restoring the trust in the profession is that we fully understand essentially all of the feedback that has come from the various reviews that have happened over the last couple of years. We understand what what the implications of that are and how ICAS can react. So while it is, it's disappointing that you know, the, the search will now be underway for a new chair, I don't believe that it will significantly slow down the work. I, I think there's also been a bit of an impact in terms of COVID as well, obviously. Yes, <laughs> yes, undoubtedly. I don't think it's, it's all gone yeah. to that, but um, I would hope that the work will continue and ICAS will continue to be part okay. of that. Now, I think what we're going to do is we're, we're going to take not a commercial break, but we're going to go to our first poll. And um, we're just going to poll the audience here. And at the end of it, I'm going to ask the three of you to reflect on, on what the poll is telling us. So as we progress with 2020, what do you, the audience, think the three CA agenda themes should focus on? And I'm going to ask you to vote on your screens. Seeing a few votes come in here. So we've got, I can see on my screen, I've got about half the votes in, so we'll just give it a bit longer. Maybe I should have asked the three panellists which one you would have predicted, but maybe that would be unfair. 
So we'll just give you another 10 seconds to vote. Okay, I think we're just about there. And on that basis, I think we have got the majority. Some are still coming in. Let's see the result there. So, so panelists, what do you think? I'm not surprised. Um, I think obviously post-COVID recovery is on everyone's minds, um, whether it's at the individual community or business level. So that makes complete sense. Um, what is really nice to see is actually uh, sustainability as well. I, I think sustainability and the post-COVID recovery are quite closely um, aligned. And I'll give you the reason why, because you know, at the moment, a lot of organizations, and as Catherine alluded to, are looking at their purpose and looking at you know, how, how are we as a company or organization supporting all of our stakeholders? So we're not just considering our shareholders, but considering our local communities, our employees, local government and national government. And the conversations really start to center around how can we take into account that decision making from a business process level and how can we actually report on that so that you know whether it's whether it's investors or the general public or national government can understand how businesses are living to their values when it comes to sustainability so whether that's social capital or natural capital etc so that's th those two are quite aligned we're seeing a lot of businesses now you know at the forefront of this pandemic whether they're you know, changing their processes in the short term to support the relief efforts or whether providing safe spaces for their for their employees whilst they manage this difficult difficult situation so i, I do think sustainability will play a big big focus um, over the next decade uh, for businesses and and governments alike okay now just before we move on to that i should say i've got a couple of chats coming in that um I, I maybe misled people in the sense of this, looking for the three agendas, but you only got one vote. So it was one vote only. So I hope you pressed your favorite first rather than your three. So apologies if my wording misled you into thinking you were getting three votes, but a clear winner. So Catherine, what do you think of the result? Uh, well, I think there was a button there which said all of the above, which got about 16% of the votes. Mm. So um, they're, they're not making our job easy for us in terms of what they want <laughs> yeah. to focus on. And, and I think, you know, again, coming to, to Indy's point, I do think a number of those themes are interconnected um, and, and don't, you know, post-COVID recovery, should it, should it actually take a lot of those themes into account? Somebody, I, I was listening to um, a podcast a couple of weeks ago that was comparing COVID to, to knocking your house down. And actually, if you were to rebuild your house, I think there'd be very few of us that would say, actually, we loved every single aspect of our house we, you know, we would think about how we might want to do it differently or how we would want to do it better. And I think we can think about post-COVID recovery in that way is actually what do we want to build back better? And so taking some of those other themes like sustainability or the future of the profession and say, what's the opportunity here? I think is a really strong message. And, I, you know, again, I think that can be something that we really do focus on both as the ICAS exec, office bearers and council, is what do we learn from the COVID crisis and how do we build back um, even better? Okay, and Bruce, uh, interesting that Brexit didn't score particularly high at all. I, I suspect that we've all got, you know, other things on our, yeah. on our mind yeah. right now other than, other than Brexit. I, uh, the, uh, one thing is for sure, uh, you know, that, that uh, this the, the the whole COVID situation has has shaken the global economy. It's um, it's caused everyone to kind of rethink the way um, you know we we live and operate. I think uh, what is going to be important for all of us uh, in all aspects of our life is is flexibility and maneuverability as we as we go forward from here and and kind of readjust uh, as as the kind of landscape settles around us. Um, you know, I'm I'm not surprised by the results of of the poll. Um, I'm also not surprised, as Catherine said, to sort of see all of the above in there. I think you know the, the, the challenges that we face are, are are unknown and and significant as we move forward from here. Uh, and you know, we'll have to do the best we can as an institute to adapt. Uh, from a from a business perspective, you know, we're back to the old adage of. of of cash is king and you know every company is going to be focused uh, very carefully on managing their cash flow um, you know th thinking about 
sustainability in it, you know, in, in, the, in the truest sense of the word, not just about the sort of CSR angle of sustainability, but, you know, actually sustainability of a business longer term is going to be at the forefront of, of everyone's mind. And, you know, again, you know, this is perhaps an opportunity for us as an institute to be, you know, out there with a PR campaign, you know, uh, advising businesses to consult the services of a CA as they, uh, as they emerge in the post-COVID world and, and, and need support to uh, develop a business plan. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. So I think we'll just move on to the second poll now. We might as well get your reaction to that one too. So could we have the second poll on the screen? So audience, in addition to the CA agenda themes, you would like to see, please start voting. So we've got about a 20% in so far. It's coming in quite quickly this time. We're just about there. So I think it looks like we, we've got most of the votes in. If we want to share the screen. So there we go. There's an assumption, the winner there, that there is a recession and there is, well, it's not an assumption. I think, I think Indy, with your former background as in your economics there, let's start with you. What do you think? Surviving and thriving in the recession, key topic that ICAST should be focused on. Of course, I think, again, it, it links back to sort of the, the previous poll question as well. Um, this topic is front and center of people's mind. I, I, I would I would say that it makes a lot of sense. During a period of dis significant disruption, there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of opportunities as well, as Catherine mentioned, when you're sort of rebuilding that house, you're doing things differently, you're adopting new ways of, of, of working. And no doubt we'll see a number of new startups and businesses that will flourish over the next decade as a result of you know what's happened now in the sense of you know recovering from from this crisis and you know uh, adopting a new way of, of, of doing things so I think that is definitely key and the more that we can support our members in terms of providing that I guess those those diversity of voices who are who are sharing their thoughts on that so whether it's you know entrepreneurs in business whether it's investment managers whether it's business leaders we've got such a breadth of, of experience within our membership base base and i think it's really around around leveraging that so i'm very glad that whilst it wasn't top of the list the piece around diversity of voices is there i think that links into that it's, it's quite it's interconnected and also you know strategy how to plan in a volatile world again all of those are are linked in and i think it's all it's really around us as an institute and our members um, supporting each other. And um, I think it links back to one of the questions Ross um, has made around what can we do as members um, to give back to the institute. And I really think it's that, that, that engagement, that broader engagement and to bring in those wide variety of voices to the, to the forefront, which will help us navigate um, this crisis. Okay, and, and Bruce, just looking at the, the poll results, what do you take out of that? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I sort of find it fascinating that this the spread of you know other than the surviving in, in recession which is a kind of clear winner this the spread across the others is is, is fairly even um, uh, you know I think again this is just back to the points that we've been you know that we've already kind of made this morning that in in an environment such as this it's the um, it is going to be the collective skills that have seen many of these things before perhaps in isolation or in, uh, to different degrees through other recessions, other economic collapses and, and whatever, you know, it, it's, it's relying on that, pulling on that knowledge and, and using that pooled skill uh, to, the, to the best of our ability, I think is gonna be a key um, to moving forward. So I think, again, as, a, as an institute, perhaps that's something that we should think about looking at results of this kind of poll is how we can create a platform for collaboration uh, and, and pooling of uh, that vast skill base that we've got across our membership base. 
Okay, and, and obviously we, we, we've designed CA Connect for people to engage with the audience, etc., and, and with their fellow members. So, President Catherine Burnett, I'm going to give you the final comment on the poll, or what, what, do, you, what do you see in there? I, I, again, I think it is, you know, we, ICAST is a member organisation, and so we're absolutely here to both protect public interest, but absolutely here for our members. And so I think it's really, you know, it is, it's great to get that feedback in terms of the membership. And I know we've also just done a sort of membership survey, a broader membership survey. So again, that's what we'll reflect on in terms of what is it that our members are looking for. Um, but, you know, even if, you know, looking at the diversity angle, we also did a, a webinar last week in terms of, you know, how do we um, improve the diversity? And it was very much focused on the diversity of thinking within ICAS. And I think this comes back to how do we get more members engaged and contributing and telling us what they want at okay. ICAS? And so that is something that both myself and I know I've spoken to Bruce and to Indy is what we are very keen as office bearers is that we continue to ensure that members are engaged and that that is a two-way conversation, not ICAS um, pushing information out, but also that we're getting the feedback and we continually evolve and improve um, and, and respond to, to what members are looking for. So I think we'll, we'll take the and combine it with all of the information, but I would ask everybody who's on the webinar today to think about how they can engage with ICAS and, and reach out to, to any of us, you, me, Bruce, or Indy, if, if they want to get involved. So panelists, office bearers, I've actually got some feedback in the Q&A panel for you. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, no, very fair. A good comment here that says, are you intending to continue with these sessions? So good to listen to you all and feel more engaged. So I think on the first point, the answer yeah. is, Yes, we, we, these, <laughs> great, these webinars are very important, but I think particularly for, for you three as the office bearers, you are the face of the Institute. And, yeah. and I think that's a, a very welcome comment. So there is a bit of a, there's a big thank you in there from, from people coming in and saying, it was really good to listen to you all. So I would like on behalf of, of the silent audience who are out there to say thank you to you three. I think um, you, you've addressed the questions openly and fairly. Um, you've given us food for thought. And for those asking, yes, this is a series of webinars. There, there is another webinar coming up next week, if I can remember the name of it. Um, but the, these will go on. So please do engage in the future webinars. They're happening every week, and you will certainly be hearing more from the office bearers. Good day for now, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you, panelists. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Bruce. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.